Okay, you know what? We are going to uh, dive in today back into the Gospel of Mark because this is our uh, big Sunday gathering. And so that's what we're usually doing in the Gospel of Mark. I didn't even mention last week, but again, I want to say thank you again live and in person this time. Uh, when Leona and I were stuck in Philadelphia last Sunday, uh, how you guys made this thing happen. It was amazing. Uh, we were online with you. <laughs> and then I was online speaking. It was weird, but, <laughs> but it was fun. So anyway, thank you guys for doing that. Kyle, of course I know your name. Uh, just, I told them. Um, it's just because I told you before we started. Yeah, so those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, I was saying thank you last week on, on video, and I said um, I want to thank, be sure to thank my daughter and for Bob and my son-in-law. What's his name again? <laughs> Just having fun. I told I told Kyle once he came into our family. Now he's sermon fodder. So it's just one of those to things. To be fair, mom forgets my name too. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, anyhow, <clears throat> all right. In the Gospel of Mark, we're going to be in uh, uh, Mark chapter ten today. Uh, there are these pew Bibles we call them, and then they're funny. I said pew, but here they are. <laughs> <Here's the chair. laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, but those are yours, by the way. If you, if you were here and you'd like to take a Bible with you, you don't have a Bible that you can read at home. Now you can always use, you know, I know that it's all online and you can use the Uversion Bible app. But you know, if you want a paper analog Bible, please just take it. You don't have to ask; it's yours. Just take it and give it to somebody if you need to. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is where we're going to be, chapter ten. And uh, last time we were in the Gospel of Mark, we saw Jesus give some warnings about sin as you might expect, but you know he didn't do it that way that often, so it did kind of come in a shocking way. Um, and then uh, the uh, warnings about the danger of hell. And then he went on to talk about the foundation and the importance of marriage and how it should be a strong and amazing covenant between a man and a woman and God who established it. And uh, I think the way I couch those terms, we put in one message, a message of dealing with uh, hell and divorce, and we just thought that would be a perfect pairing uh, for that message, but that's, that was last time. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, I, and I just realized you guys don't have the context of that. That sounds like I'm being har harsh. We love everyone in this room. We're, we are a variety of people, uh, divorced, undivorced, but we did talk about that in that message. And uh, anyway, if you're interested in that, please check that out online. Uh, but next, here's what happens next. Something happens that is recorded for us in both the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, and in the Gospel of Luke. It's a very short little story. It's a short thing that happens. But it is very interesting that in Scripture, it's recorded in three of those tellings of the life of Jesus. So if we were to uh, dig into it, uh, we would see how powerful it is. If we examine it very closely, we'll see that there's some truths for all of us here this morning. And that is what we're going to do today. But before we do that, before we dive in, dive in again, let's pray once more together. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for preserving it for us all of these years. That it is the most important thing that is going to be coming out of anybody's mouth here this morning. That's not what I say, Lord, but only your word. Your word is powerful. It is true. It will stand the test of time. So God, we thank you for the words of Scripture. Help us this morning, Lord, to have soft hearts and to have uh, ears that are open to hear what you want us to hear today as we look at your word. And thank you again for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's dive into this now. We're in Mark chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 13, and we're going to get the very first part of this. And it simply says this. <coughs> People were bringing little children. What? <laughs> now, so, before I go any farther, people were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. Let's stop there for a minute. Uh, yeah, this just sort of happened this way in our planning that this was where we would be as we did a parent-child dedication. I just thought that was kind of cool. But anyway, people were bringing little children to him. The him we're talking about is Jesus. All right, so we just saw that he was talking about some pretty hard things. He was talking about some hard truths. He was talking to a variety of crowds and a variety of people within that crowd. And then what happened is that people were bringing to him little children. Right? So the idea is that they were like babies, they were like toddlers, and these parents were coming up to Jesus and bringing them to him. Now, I, I want to acknowledge, I mentioned this earlier, that children are simply a gift from the Lord. They are a heritage from Him. In fact, Psalms chapter 127, verses 3 through 5 says this, Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons born in one's youth. Happy 
is the man who has filled his quiver with them. They will never be put to shame when they speak with their enemies at the city gate. And this idea is that they were bringing those kids to Jesus. You know, my, I came from a family where my parents brought me to church. Uh, I used to refer to it as like a baby in church because uh, I was born on like Thursday. I mean, I was in church like the next week. It was really, and my parents, right? Now, I, you know, I got up and I, I hailed a cab and then I drove to, <laughs> no, they brought me. I guess it would be, everybody, everybody was looking at me kind of funny. <laughs> Does he really think he walked himself to church at the age of three days? <laughs> no, my parents brought me to church. They brought me to church. They made a decision I couldn't really make very well on my own, right? They brought them, brought the kids uh, to Jesus, and uh, you know, sometimes my parents even left us there. I mean, that was weird. <laughs> my, uh, my, I have two brothers and a sister, and uh, one Sunday, that is what happened. I think I've told the story to a few of you guys, but yeah, we were at church, and bustling around. Those of you who have many kids, you understand this idea, right? You're trying to get everybody together. You think everybody's, you know, all the kids are in the car. Dad just got the other car. And as you're driving home, they realized they left my brother Kenny. Left my church. <laughs> But they thought, well, we've already got two other boys. We'll be all right. So he's still there to this day. Anyway, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but they brought him to Jesus. They brought the children to Jesus. Uh, my parents brought me to church. You have your parent today and you love the Lord. You should be bringing your children to church. Well, if they're two years old or three years old, they're like, I don't want to go. Well, then you should just do what they say, right? No, no, bring them. Bring the children anyway. Anyhow, all right. <clears throat> Now, children are a gift, but you today may be overwhelmed by your gifts today. Let's just check the reality here for a moment. <laughs> right? Sometimes this is what happens. It happens in churches. Some pastor, somebody, some of their, their gift, they're a beautiful thing. And you're like, you should have seen them this morning, man. You should have heard them last night. Not much of a gift. What kind of gift is this? You might be thinking, right? And you may be overwhelmed by your gifts. I remember when I turned eight years old. Uh, it was my birthday. I couldn't wait. I... It was hard to sleep the night before because they, my parents had told me that they were going to bring me some gifts, a bunch of gifts. Now, they weren't big, expensive gifts. They were a lot of little gifts, right? And so I was excited about that. So when I woke up on my birthday, I barely opened my eyes, but I was trying to pretend to still be asleep, right? And I hear my brother coming in the room, and he's got this big bag of gifts, and he's like, happy birthday, dropped it right on my face. <laughs> and so I woke up with almost a broken nose <laughs> on my birthday because my gifts were causing me quite a pain. Well, maybe you feel like that <laughs> about your kids this morning. Maybe they're driving you crazy right now, but hang in there, parents. Ultimately, children, they really are a gift. They're a heritage. They are a blessing from the Lord. And uh, these, these guys were actually bringing their children to Jesus. But yeah, they can be a pain. My son, we were in Philadelphia, as I said last week, and my son is one of the pastors in a church called the Block Church in Philadelphia. And uh, it just reminds me, they were doing a parent-child dedication last Sunday. I didn't know they were going to be doing that. So I was like, well, this is kind of cool, right? And so uh, it was neat to see my boy standing up praying over parents and children, just like we did here today. And it just reminded me that, oh yeah, that's what we did with him all of those years ago. And so it kind of came full circle to see the Lord's blessing in our life. But I also thought about the interview I had at a church one time. Oh, no. <laughs> she knows this. I remember this very well. I forgot. You know, Leah, whenever you're in the room, because you're, you're often in the back, she's, she's doing the message with me. Have you guys noticed that? She's interjecting. I love it. I love this life with you. Yeah, we do it together. We're together in this. Yeah, so I was all nervous, right? I'd moved in, and we were you know, doing this interview. It was on a Saturday morning, and um, it was kind of a big deal. It was like a, a moving up to a, kind of a full-time deal. I was getting ready to go to seminary at the time as well. and uh, So we were nervous about this move. We were coming from deep east Texas. We were moving to the Dallas-Fort Worth we're Metroplex. In Cowboy boots. <laughs> you know, no. So anyway, <laughs> so we get there. <laughs> we're in Cowboy boots. We were, actually. Uh, but anyhow. So as we get into this, Matthew, my son, the one I was just describing, how old was he? He wasn't even a year old. No, he, he well, no, he, he, was he turned one, yeah, 1990. So anyway, so we come in there, and I'm, I'm all nervous, and I'm going through this interview, and I'm answering questions, and I'm trying to be professional and everything. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and Matthew, he just diarrhea all in his... <laughs> Up his back, down his legs. Yeah, it was explosive. On the carpet. 
Now, for those of you who don't have any kids, you're all going, ew, gross. So if you have kids, you're going, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I've <laughs> seen it. It ain't pretty. And not only that, it reminds me of, what, what, of this little, on the floor here, we had a little spill. But yeah, it was onto the carpet. Well, there you and in this, guy's, <laughs> in this guy's office. And it was on the floor. And then we realized we didn't bring enough diaper. We didn't no, we have diapers. We just don't. Had no clothes. That's what it was. I don't know what we were thinking. We were young, and we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, but anyhow, yeah, it's like, ah. Oh, Treasures, right? Treasures, <laughs> a gift. But you know what? I was there for 11 and a half years, so I guess it was okay, right? Hang in there, parents, is what I'm saying. These guys were bringing their parents to Jesus. We need to continue to bring our children to Jesus in any way we can. Now, there was a whole series of messages I did back in the fall in the road trip series that dealt with parenting, so I'm not going to go into all that right now, but they're all available on YouTube if you want to check those out. But here's a quick snapshot from one of those messages, and that is just a reminder that we love children at Compass. We do. We don't have a lot of children. Sometimes they're here for a while and then they're gone and then they come back and then there's some that we get new ones and little ones. I mean, they sometimes sort of float through, but we love children. Now, uh, we want all of them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That's our heart. That's our desire uh, and place their lives in his hands. But we're just partners with you. We're only partners with you, right? They're not our children. They are your children. And we might see them for maybe 30 week, uh, minutes every couple of weeks or so. There's no way that we can train them up fully in the knowledge of the Lord. So God has given parents that wonderful responsibility. The Bible makes it very clear that ultimately that responsibility for teaching children to love the Lord isn't just the church, but it's, it's you as a, as a parent. Now, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So there's the admonition from Scripture. And by the way, this is not a heavy-handed guilt thing. All of us are flawed, right? All of us mess up in this regard. All of us do things, uh, and we wish that we had done them better. But that is the teaching from Scripture that it is our responsibility. Now, many of you have heard uh, Proverbs 22, 6, quoted often in church. And it simply says, here's the King James Version. King Tracy, King, King, King Jimmy today. <laughs> <clears throat> Proverbs 22, 6. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, you may already have some pushback about this whole idea. You might be saying to yourself, look, I don't want to influence, force, or brainwash my kids about this. I want them to decide for themselves. Well, I have a newsflash for you if you have not heard it before. They are going to decide for themselves. <laughs> You can't make them believe. You can't make them decide. You can do everything right and them still go, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Right? We're sort of free moral agents in that regard. However, we have a responsibility as parents to at least provide direction for them in that truth. Right? It's the old, you, you can't lead a horse to water, or you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. But for heaven's sake, lead the horse to the water. Right? So, CSB translates the Hebrew of that passage in this way. It says, start a youth out on his way, and even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. Here's a quote from a guy named Dave Miller, and he said it this way, This is not a promise to parents to raise their children, who, cha who raise their children properly, but it is a warning to those who allow their adolescence to grow up without guidance. Now, think about that verse again another way. Some have said, wait, if I do this, then this is going to happen, right? That's the promise. And he's saying, no, it's not really a promise. It's more of a warning to the parents that you have a responsibility to lead them in the right way. Children left to their own way are not likely to change. They'll become adults who go their own way, maybe the wrong way. Uh, interestingly, Solomon in the Old Testament wrote uh, later in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, that folly is bound up in the heart of a child. And so children don't always know what is best. They just know who they trust and who's willing, who, who they should listen to or not. They don't always know who they should, but they know whether uh, they know who they have chosen to listen to and learn from. And so I just want to say, parents, help them to be, uh, you know, to hear you. Help them to hear truth from you, because if you don't, I guarantee you there's a whole world out there ready to teach them something totally different. All right? So we all learn and we all listen from somebody. Ultimately, though, here's the thing, by the way, they are not fully trained if they themselves don't participate in the training. 
In other words, if they don't listen, if they don't learn what it is you're teaching, then the, the proverb is still true because they're not fully trained. Even though you've done all you can to train them, they may decide no and not listen, um, th and they won't learn, right? So they're not fully trained. Uh, it reminds me of the teacher meme I saw the other day. <laughs> yeah, teacher memes, those are great. <clears throat> um, go to Instagram and you find teacher memes. Anyway, it simply said, stop saying they didn't teach us that in school. Yes, they did, but you were talking. <laughs> 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 All right. So anyway, the heart behind this is just bring your children, man. Bring your children to the Lord. I mean, and if you go to a church and things are getting wonky and weird and it's just not working, well, you know what? If you need to go and be a part somewhere, I'll do that. But just bring them to church, man. Bring them to Jesus. Point them to the Lord. So back to our passage <laughs> this morning. Mark chapter 10, verse 13, the first part of it. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the idea is a blessing kind of touching. So during this time... It was common for people to bring their children to a special rabbi or teacher uh, in order that he might give them some kind of special blessing. And that, that rabbi would place his hands on that child or on their head, and he would pray a blessing over them. Now, Jesus at this time had become kind of popular, right? He was drawing crowds. He was saying all kinds of stuff, shaking things up. <coughs> and because of his popularity, it is not really surprising that there weren't some families going, let's, let's bring him to the rabbi. Let's bring our kids to the rabbi and let him bless them. But look at the last part of this verse. These guys. But the disciples rebuked them. All right, so there's people. They've got their kids. I can almost buy them all lined up, coming to see Jesus, right? It's like going to see Santa Claus. Are right? you guys ever right? take your kids to Santa Claus in the department store? And they're all lined up holding their kids. Who knows how many there were, but they're all coming up to see Jesus. And the disciples, man, they're like the, uh, I don't know, they're like his bodyguards all of a sudden. And they turn and they, and they begin to rebuke these. They're like, what are you doing? No, no, no. Leave the, leave the master alone. Leave him alone. He's busy. Jesus is real busy. He hasn't got time for you. And they start rebuking the people, <coughs> excuse me, who were bringing their children to Jesus. Okay, I'm going to have to pause real quick. <laughs> and I apologize for that. But anyway, so they, re they rebuked him. Jesus' response to his disciples and his welcoming of children is uh, especially noteworthy given the lowly place that children actually generally had in the culture at the time. I don't mean they didn't love their kids. They did love their kids. But children were not seen as like a valuable uh, contributor to society in any way. Uh, they were seen as property in some ways by families and culture. And it wasn't until they reached a certain age that they would even pay any attention to children often. And so here's Jesus, I mean, in some fairness to the disciples. But once again, we see the disciples displaying a very poor understanding of what Jesus' priorities were. <laughs> And this happens again and again and again. And I'm always hard on the disciples because I'm thinking, gosh, what's wrong with you guys? And I think, oh, we'd probably be the same way. Not necessarily in this particular instance, but most of the time. Uh, so anyhow, what's, what's amazingly interesting about this to me is that Jesus had just, in a few verses back in the, in the narrative of Mark, he had just taught his disciples a lesson <laughs> about servanthood and about humility and what it meant to follow Jesus. And in that context, he used as an example, he sits down and he brings a little child and he sits him in his lap. And he says, this is what true greatness really is like. This is what I, the kind of kingdom I'm talking about has. In fact, in Mark chapter 9, verses 35 through 37, it says, Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He took a child, had him stand among them, taking him in his arms. He said to them, whoever welcomes one little child such as this in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but him who sent me. Wow, think about this for a minute. Jesus raises the value of these little humans whom he loves. Children. And then he describes them in a way that was very uncommon for the day. Uh, and, and I'm thinking of these disciples, man, they were being the guardians of things. Have you ever met people like this? Maybe in a church or somewhere, and they're just like, keep those kids out of here. Keep those kids away. Make those kids stop. Kids, stop doing it. Um, years ago, I was a youth pastor at a church, and we had this big building. and We had a youth area. So these weren't like little kids. These were like teenagers. And uh, we had a Wednesday night thing. <laughs> How stereotypical can we get? A Wednesday night youth thing, right? <laughs> Hey, it just worked out. And uh, so we'd have all these kids coming in, right? And they would come in, and they would, we would have an awesome time. We'd play games. We'd, we'd have food sometime, pizza and things. And Anyway, but there was always somebody who would come up and say, you know, we got to do something about these kids. 
What? What are you talking about? Somebody <laughs> spilled something. <laughs> Somebody spilled something in the room. We got to clean that up. Yeah, we're gonna have to do something about it. We're having too many wild kids coming through here. I'm saying, what? What are you talking about? This is our whole purpose. We want them to be here. I was just thankful we had kids in the room to mess it up, right? <laughs> Let's clean it up. <laughs> we'll clean it up. And this is why it is here. Oh my goodness. Well, anyhow, it reminds me of Proverbs 14:4. It says, "Where there are no oxen, the feeding trough is empty, but an abundant harvest comes through the strength of an ox." It's like you can have a pristine building, you have a beautiful barn, and you can paint it. <coughs> That's like on HGTV or something, right? You paint your barn <laughs> all beautiful, and it will be clean. Because you don't have any animals in it, right? But that's not really what the barn is for. The, the reason you have the barn is to, is to house the animals. And do, I'm, I'm about to go into, like, I know what farming is all about. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the point, right? I mean, it's like it's the reason you have it. It would be beautiful if you didn't have it. But, I mean, the, the purpose of it is to have those things, right? Well, anyhow. Uh, Jesus, dis, uh, he, I'm sorry, the disciples rebuked them. And here's the response of Jesus. Um, and it's simply this, verse 14. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me. Now I said it the way I imagine he probably said it, but I don't know how he said it. But the idea that he is indignant here, right? He says he was indignant at them. Do you, when you think of Jesus, do you think of him being indignant? Right? We don't even use that word that often because often we're not that indignant, right? Well, I mean, this word is one that means to be very displeased, irritated, uh, vexed is another word. I like that word. That's a word we should bring back. Vexed. I am really vexed with you right now, Tracy. Vexed. <laughs> You're still Milan aside, man. I'm sorry. You were there. All right. It's just to be annoyed, right? And it's like Jesus was like. It's like when you tell somebody to do something and and. Uh, they go and they're doing it completely the opposite of what you're telling them to do. It's like if you, if you say, uh, uh, son, go and uh, take out the trash. And they go, okay, and they start going up the stairs to their room, and the trash is over here. It's like, wait, 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 what, what are you doing? It's like the opposite of what, <laughs> what I was wanting you to do. Well, this is how Jesus is responding to his disciples, right? They, they are uh, doing the opposite of what his heart for them is. Uh, he says, let the little children come to me. Let them come to me. Now, can you imagine if you were the parents of those children as you're walking by the disciples? <laughs> I told you. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> Jesus loves children, and children often respond in love to Jesus. And we want to welcome and encourage children to place their faith in Jesus, even though they don't understand it all. Uh, I know we're getting uh, to the end of our time here, but um, I remember when I was a child, I did not understand everything. It was, it was around that time, I just told you about the gifts smashing in my face. <laughs> it was around that age that I uh, placed my faith in Jesus. And I still remember the night, um, or, or, yeah, I talked with my mom and I asked her, what is this? What is it? We went to a very uh, you know, traditional church back in the day and I had to dress up and wear a tie and I was a little kid, you know. <laughs> We had pews, but before that I was actually sitting in a balcony and it was bucket seats, but not like at the theater. They were like hard seats, mm -hmm. you know? So you guys know what's up. And um, I just noticed that people, uh, at the end of our service, they would have an altar call and they would invite people to place their faith in Jesus. And uh, in, in that service, people would actually come forward and they'd take the pastor's hand. And I said, what are you doing, Mom? I don't understand. And so that, that night, I, I talked with my mom. I said, what, is, what does this mean? And she explained to me. She said, well, Johnny... Um, First, you got to understand what sin is, and I didn't know what she meant. She was sin, and and in her way, the best she could describe it is is anything that keeps me from uh, from knowing God, anything living my life without Jesus, doing things that are not pleasing to Him. And then she named a few things that I know I had done. <laughs> oh, I have done that. I have done that. And so she helped me understand that Jesus actually took that sin upon Himself, so I wouldn't have to. Uh, be separated from God forever. She was really, really good about how she was describing it in a way that an eight-year-old boy was understanding. But she didn't have to explain much. You know why? Because I knew I was a sinner. Eight years old. Hadn't robbed any banks. Hadn't murdered anybody yet. 
just like, what? But I hadn't done any of those things, but I was a sinner. I knew I was. I knew I had a need. It just it was a conviction in my heart. I knew immediately, wait a minute, that's me. And I wanted to place my faith in Jesus. As she described, I wanted to love God. I didn't know what words I was supposed to say. And so I went and talked to the pastor, and he was a very formal dude. And he talked much like this <laughs> as he spoke. And he told me, Johnny, if you're still, he, he explained it all a little bit more than my mom did. He said, if you still feel like this is, I, I think he was trying to be really careful because I was little. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to lead me astray. And we don't want to lead any kid astray. We don't put words in their mouth. We want to guide them because it's a sensitive time. We've got to be very, very careful about that. Sometimes kids will do things just because they want to make you happy, right? And it's not a genuine thing in their heart. So you've got to be very careful as we do this. But we also don't want to turn them away. If they're seeking, they're asking, tell them. Love them. Show them. <clears throat> help them to understand what you're saying. And she said, he said to me, Johnny and I, in our evening service, <laughs> uh, in our evening service, uh, if you're still sensing that this is what you need to do, I want you to come forward during our invitation. <laughs> i got to stop talking like that. Anyway, uh, and so I'm sitting there, and I just remember thinking, I need, I need Jesus. I, I need Jesus. And all through the message, I wasn't even listening, much like some of you today. <laughs> Not really listening. It's almost lunch, right? And I, I just like, no, I, I, need, I know I need him. And I didn't hear what he said, but I was waiting for that music to start, and I almost ran down that aisle, <coughs> took him by the hand. <laughs> all those years ago, it's choking me up a little. I can't believe it is, but it is. God changed my heart, changed my life when I was eight years old. Never regretted none of that. I didn't understand it all. Okay, that's the thing. I did not understand it all. You don't have to understand it all either today. Uh, and so I placed my faith in Jesus. I got baptized after that. And I remember uh, my father uh, being with me as I was baptized and, and how encouraging that was. Uh, let's move to the next verse here real fast as we're getting ready to wrap this up. Um, it simply says this. Jesus told them why we should let the little children come to him. It said in verse 14, the rest of that, don't stop them. Because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then he continues in verse 15. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Wait, you're saying I don't have to get a degree? I don't have to know everything about the Bible? I don't have to become a scholar? I say this all the time. I'm not interested in building scholars of Jesus, but developing followers of Jesus who run after him like a child chasing his dad. Right? If you become a scholarly disciple, that's cool too, right? But not just making uh, scholars. So anyway, he says, if you don't receive the kingdom of God like a little child, you'll never enter it. Not childish. He wants us to grow up in our faith. He wants us to mature. He wants us to grow, right? But childlike. Do you remember being a child? Do you remember that joyous day, Christmas Eve or whatever it was? Some, some moment when you were a kid and you did something and you experienced something or you're looking forward to something? And there was somebody else paying the bills. You remember all that? <laughs> you didn't have to worry about it. And you had fun. And you had joy. And I know some of you, your childhood was not quite like that. And the same is true. Jesus is offering. This is why he says, no, no, no. Nobody else may love you. Nobody else may care about you. Nobody else is providing. The reason I'm getting choked up about that, I'm looking here, I'm saying, Leona, I'm looking over here, I'm saying, Lewis, and I know kids in this school who are that. <clears throat> So it's, it's putting, a, putting a face on it for me. So I uh, apologize. Uh, not childish, but childlike. Are you open? Are you humble? Are you needy? Are you ready to trust him? Something about a kid that reaches up to dad or to mom uh, who loves them, and they, they don't know how their legs work. They don't know how muscles happen. They've never had the the class and how our bodies work and muscles are strong and whatever. They just know that I love you. Would you pick me up? Some of you today, all of us today, need to respond to the Lord like a child. Just to trust in Him. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know Him and He will make your path straight. So the last verse is this. Verse 16, After taking them in His arms, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. So when the children were brought to Jesus, Jesus welcomed them, he embraced them, and he blessed them. And this is how he will meet you today as well, if you will trust in him with all of your heart. Last quote today, a guy named Daniel Aiken said, Children are helpless. They don't know all they need. 
but they know they need the help of another. And they are hopeful they will receive it. They come small, helpless, and powerless. They have no clout or standing. And they bring nothing but empty hands. This is appropriate, since only empty hands can be filled. So how about you today? Where are you in your relationship with God? Have you ever placed your faith and trust in Him to save you? I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes for just a moment. If that's you this morning, maybe you've never really thought about it in this way, or maybe God is just speaking to you, and just like me when I was a kid, I didn't understand all of this stuff, but I just knew there was something burning in me, and I just knew I needed, I needed the Lord. And I need somebody to help me, to pray through it. Somebody to help me, guide me, teach me, show me. And maybe that's you today. And, and maybe you've been uh, on the outside looking in. Maybe you've been in church, and you've seen it, and you've seen others experience the Lord, but you have not. You know deep down in your heart, you really don't know Him, but you want to today. And you need to understand, of course, Romans 3.23 that says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 that says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that's you, that's me, that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the invitation today is Romans 10.13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that you this morning? If so, and you're ready, you want to place your faith in Jesus, you can pray with me right now. Jesus, today I realize, I confess, I'm a sinner and I need you. I'm believing today that you died on a cross for me. You rose from the dead. You made it possible for me to be forgiven and have a new life. So I'm believing on you right now just to save me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. Change me. Make me a new person. And I'm giving my heart and my life to you today. Help me to follow you with all that I am from this day forward. Please save me right now. If you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you can pray this with me. Lord, I pray that you would help me to stop thinking I'm so grown up. And Lord, help me to see you as a loving Father today. Remind, remind me, Lord, of the joy that I can have as I trust you with all of my heart. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for uh, dying on a cross and forgiving me of all of my sin. But Lord, today, I pray you'd soften my heart, help me to have a childlike faith in you, and help me to become more and more like you in my thoughts, attitudes, and actions as I go through this week. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.